We're recording. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Southern California, the University of California, Riverside. We're pleased to have you with us again this week for another exciting, interesting program. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the Eaton Collection uh, at the library at UC Riverside. And with us today, we have presentations um, from three individuals. Uh, but let me first introduce you to Cherry Williams. Cherry, is her key responsibility is to provide leadership to a team of librarians and professionals. And she is also responsible for all aspects of the collections, services, operations, development, and stewardship of special collections and university archives. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in nursing and pediatric nurse practitioner certificate from the University of Colorado, an MA from the University of Chicago, and an MLIS from UCLA, sister campus. Cherry joined the library at UC Riverside in 2016. I am pleased to introduce you to Cherry Williams. Good evening, and thank you so much for having us. We are delighted to be here and to share one of our many special collections um, at the University of California, Riverside. Um, I have just a few housekeeping moments before we start. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to ask any and all questions. Um, we relish being able to answer them and Sandy and Andrew are particularly well equipped to do that. Um, so please put your questions in the Q&A box and then we can help Andrew and Sandy make sure that they see all of those. Um, as you may know, this presentation is being recorded and Melly assures me that what you will find in your email boxes uh, tomorrow or next week will be a full recording of the proceedings. So if you need to leave us early or you are afraid you may have missed something or wanted to share it with anyone, please be assured that that will be there for you. Um, the one thing I do want to say for all of you, sometimes special collections can be a little intimidating for people. And should you choose to attend UCR or if you already are, when we are able to open back up. And one of the things I like to share with the students is to, we are there for you to help you do your research projects and find all kinds of interesting things. But we are also there for you to help you just clear your head when it's like, whoa, you know, I can't think about this any longer and I run out of rabbit holes. You're always welcome to come up and look at our medieval manuscripts or read comic books or play with our pop-up books or look at our artist books. So think of us as a multi-stop organization. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Sandy Enriquez. Sandy is our public services, outreach and community engagement librarian. And she'll tell you more about herself, but she has come to us from NYU, Sandy. Thank you so much, Cherry. So Hello everyone, we're very excited to be here to share with you some information about the Egan Collection, what it contains, and what are the different ways that we are utilizing that collection here at UCR. So I'll pass it on to my colleague, Andrew, to introduce himself. Hello, my name is Andrew Lippert. I'm the Special Collections Processing Archivist, uh, which means I handle collections when they come in um, and help make them accessible for researchers um, and write finding aids for the collections and generally just help people uh, use our materials. Uh, and I've also been uh, doing a lot of work with the Eaton Collection the last couple of years. Um, so I've, I've gained some, some definite expertise on this specific aspect of our collections. And uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of interesting things to tell you uh, tonight about this, this part of our collection. I will go ahead and screen share here and we will get started. Right, Sandy, are we good? Yeah, let's go ahead and move into our next slide. All right, so thank you everyone for those wonderful introductions and for being here for our presentation today. 
Let's go ahead and go to our next slide as well. So we wanted to share our contact information in case you have any follow-up questions after today's presentation. We always welcome you to reach out to us. Um, we're definitely here to answer any questions about the Eaton, as well as other collections that we have in our department of special collections and university archives. So next slide, please. So before we dive in, I did want to take a moment to talk about our positionality as members of the UCR community. We at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kauia, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, as well as their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Though we now meet in digital spaces, we invite you to learn whose ancestral lands you're physically located on by visiting native-land.ca. We also stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matters and their allies in the fight against white supremacy, police brutality, and other human rights violations. Next slide, please. So I'll go ahead and pass it on to my colleague, Andrew, to get us started. Yeah, so we'll start off with uh, just a little bit of a background on the Eaton Collection, right? You might be wondering, you know, it has this big title. What, what does that all really mean? Um, what is the collection? Uh, so the Eaton Collection is part of Special Collections, um, which is and the University Archives Department, uh, located in the library at UCR, and it is one of the first academic collections of science fiction materials, and it began with the donation of the personal library of Dr. J. Lloyd Eaton in 1969. Uh, he lived up in the Bay Area in Berkeley, uh, and he was a medical doctor, and his donation was about 7,500 books. Uh, just over 50 years ago that he gave that to us. He was a longtime fan and critic of science fiction. Uh, and when he gave his collection to the library, it was unheard of uh, at that time for an entire personal library of that kind to be donated to a special collections department. Um, and you know, back in the 60s, this was before science fiction studies became um, an area of academic inquiry. And so it was uh, generally not seen as a particularly high value item or collection to add. Um, another important figure in the development of the Eaton Collection is the first curator, George Slusser. And he became curator in 1980, uh, a year after he joined the UCR faculty as a professor of comparative literature. Uh, and he was instrumental in growing the collection and raising its profile, in large part through creating an academic conference for the study of science fiction. Um, and, you know, bringing graduate students in and uh, helping people get doctoral degrees, studying science fiction as part of the English and the complex departments. Um, and he ended up being a, a, a significant and uh, foundational uh, contributor to the development of science fiction studies as a discipline, as an academic area of inquiry. And in, in many ways, if not for George Slusser and the work that he did with the Eaton Collection, uh, during his time in UCR, uh, it's hard to say that science fiction studies would have developed the way that it did or when it did. Uh, and we can, in many ways, credit him uh, for the existence of the speculative fictions and cultures of science program uh, here at UCR. He was a, a, a big part of, of the development of that program as well. Uh, and on this slide, we have a couple, couple fun pictures here. So on the left is an image of uh, Dr. Eaton, uh, and he's, you know, in this costume, which I always uh, find very amusing, and I think it speaks to the, that aspect of fandom, right? It, it shows his sort of engagement and his, his personal involvement as a fan, right? And, uh, you know, he collected books and he was engaging um, with the fandom culture of the time. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have a picture of George Slusser uh, a little bit later in his career um, in the Eaton Stacks. So on the last slide, I mentioned that uh, you know, it started with Eaton's uh, personal uh, library of 7,500 volumes. Uh, today, the collection includes over 200,000 cataloged items, which includes books, comics, graphic novels, pulp magazines, fanzines, art, and visual media. Uh, it also includes uh, 86 manuscript collections. Uh, this includes author's papers, uh, collections of fandom materials. We have some um, organizational records, 
for uh, groups like the New York Review of Science Fiction um, or fan groups uh, don't have it donated, you know, clubs and, and people like that have uh, donated some of their materials as well. Uh, and a big part of this, again, uh, I mentioned Slusser on the previous page, he was pretty instrumental in uh, the growth of the collection to what it is today. Uh, and there are a couple fun stories uh, of Slusser's curatorship. Uh, so when I mentioned that he was in the conflict department and he, you know, he, he guided graduate students through that program, uh, he would also send them off to international destinations uh, and he'd give them like a hundred bucks maybe 200 bucks, uh, you know, in the 70s or 80s, which is a decent amount of money. And he would, he would task them with finding science fiction in countries around the world, sometimes in gray or black markets, sometimes behind the Iron Curtain. Um, so he was, he was sending his students off in pursuit of materials to bring back to the Eden Collection and help develop and build the collection uh, and make it an international collection. Uh, closer to home, uh, there are a couple really just hard to believe stories um, of donations that he found. Uh, in one case, uh, a, a good chunk of the pulp magazine collection that we have now came from a donor who had drained their swimming pool and was storing boxes of magazines outside in their swimming pool. And so he worked with them and uh, managed to arrange that donation. And so that helped really build out some of the some of the pulp magazines that we have. Uh, and there was another one um, where he found a donor who had 30,000 paperbacks that were in near mint condition um, that and the donor had to get rid of these these books because they weighed so much that the foundation of their house was starting to sink. Um, so it's it's just kind of funny, you know, you. you he, he really sort of pounded the pavement and went out in pursuit of, um, you know, these early big donations. Uh, and he, he left no stone unturned in terms of trying to find this material. Uh, and on this slide, we have a couple examples that sort of show the range of the types of materials that we have. So we have, um, like on the bottom right, there's a, a book, um, book cover. Uh, and then we have a, next to that is a pulp magazine cover. Uh, on the bottom left, there's a, a manuscript page from um, an author's collection where it shows sort of that markup, the editorial process. Uh, and we also have a couple items here that demonstrate that fandom aspect as well, right? We have some Star Trek collectible items um, and there's a, another wonderful picture of uh, fans at a convention uh, in costume. You know, they would have, uh, this goes all the way back to the, to the beginning of fandom. And I believe this picture is from the 60s. Um, but they would have, you know, people would dress up and they would walk the runway at conventions and there would be competitions and, you know, you'd have people would win awards for best science fiction costume, best fantasy costume, uh, and things like that. So we have a pretty, pretty wide range, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not just books. It's not just pulps. Um, you know, we have these photographs, we have author's papers. It's a, it's a really rich and deep collection. sort of leads us to the question of, of why collect science fiction, right? So when Slusser gave his, or not Slusser, when Eaton gave his collection to the university, science fiction studies wasn't, wasn't really much of a thing yet. Um, but, you know, the, the, the librarians at the time, the archivists at the time um, could see value in the collection. Uh, and science fiction has always been a genre that has uh, many connections with the society around it that's creating it. And in many ways, it serves as a mirror to society and culture, not always directly, uh, but in the ways that society can envision itself and what it wants to be or could be. Uh, sometimes this is imaginative, hopeful, and uplifting. We can think of things like Star Trek. Um, and at other times, this can be more critical or a warning about the potential negative futures. Uh, and great examples of this are from George Orwell's 1984, or Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451. Um, because of this relational nature of science fiction, changes in culture and society are very often replicated within the, the shifts and changes of the genre landscape. Um, an example of this is the rise of new wave science fiction uh, in the 60s and the 70s. They came out of the same turmoil um, 
you know, that generated the anti-war movements, the civil rights movement, um, hippies, rock and roll movements, right? All of this social and cultural turmoil in the 60s and the 70s um, spilled over into science fiction as well. So in much in the same way, the new wave, uh, in the same way of those, those other social movements were critiques of the world around the people who were in those movements, uh, the new wave was a rejection of sort of some older and stifling conventions within uh, the science fiction genre that were left over from um, the golden age of like the 40s, the 50s. Um, and much in the same way that these other uh, social cultural movements were uh, a similar rejection, right, of American culture in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, and the rise of science fiction studies in the 70s and 80s, sort of following in the new wave movement a little bit, um, you know, demonstrates uh, the value that these collections have, right? So people like George Slusser, uh, recognizing and acknowledging science fiction, having this power of observation and critique, but also um, imagining futures uh, ahead of us. Uh, there were other people like James Gunn at the University of Kansas, uh, Darko Suvin, who is at the uh, McGill University up in Canada, um, and then Sam Moskowitz is an example of somebody who was part of the fandom culture, but was also uh, involved in this sort of intellectual critical aspect. Uh, and these people, uh, and there are many more, uh, but these are just a handful of people who really helped drive the study of science fiction uh, and turn it into this intellectual um, academic uh, field of inquiry. So it's science fiction is this really powerful tool and um, a great example of this is, you know, we have the new wave, right, rejecting sort of um, mid 20th century, or not, not necessarily rejecting, but critiquing the middle 20th century culture. Uh, you have other movements like cyberpunk in the 1980s or 90s, which has been seeing a, a resurgence in the last 10 years or so. Um, you also have climate fiction, uh, which emerged in the late 20th century, but uh, likewise has seen a real resurgence uh, for understandable reasons. Um, and then in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a real strong push for diversity and inclusion across the science fiction and fantasy genres to incorporate Afrofuturisms, indigenous futurisms, um, other alternative futurisms to bring in more diverse voices, uh, stories, and creators. Um, and we've also seen an introduction to the West of Chinese science fiction. So there's, right, this is sort of, we're sort of running through this big long list of, of aspects of science fiction. And I think uh, it's just really the tip of the iceberg and it, it gives you just sort of a sense of, of what you can do with science fiction when you start to, to, to chip away at it and, and dig at it a little bit more and, and some of the power that the, the genre has um, both creatively, but also critically. Uh, and on this page, we have a couple of great images, right? Uh, Captain Kirk with his communicator. Um, I love an image like this because it shows, right, in the 60s, people were already envisioning flip phones. And obviously, we've moved past flip phones. But, um, you know, Star Trek saw so much of the world that came that came to be around us, like uh, automatic doors or, uh, you know, handheld communication devices of that nature. Um, I also like, uh, I mentioned cyberpunk. Uh, the show, the subgenre cyberpunk and uh, Neuromancer was a foundational book um, in the formation of that subgenre. Uh, and that really developed the concepts of virtual reality and cyberspace. And um, the author who wrote Neuromancer coined the term cyberspace uh, back in the 80s. So, um, and if you, you see this image, it, it evokes a lot of both the sort of the, the the 1980s, it has that sort of greedy, uh, futuristic look of the 80s, but it also, if you look at somebody doing VR today, um, the headset basically looks exactly like that, right? Like, so again, it's it's this envisioning the world around us, and it's, and in some ways, it's a chicken and an egg question, right? It's, did, did science fiction create the world around us, or did we look back at the science fiction and make it, make our world in science fiction's image? Um, and uh, on the bottom right is uh, N.K. Jemisin after she won her third Hugo Award, um, the first person ever to three-peat uh, back to back to back uh, to win the Hugo Award three years in a, in a row. Um, that was just a, a handful of years ago. Um, but I think at this point, I will pass back to my colleague, Sandy, uh, who will talk a little bit about how we use these materials and how people use the collection. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. 
So now that we have a good foundation for understanding how we got this collection and what it contains, I want to pivot to talking about how we utilize the collection through research, outreach, education, and more. So it helps to know who exactly are the users of this collection. Well, our primary users include students, both graduate and undergraduate, faculty, of course, those in our other category, which includes the general public, as well as non-UC affiliated scholars, and can even include younger students in elementary school to high school. And lastly, we have our interlibrary loan request category, meaning that we receive requests for scans of materials for scholars who have difficulty visiting us in person. And these requests can come from both other UC affiliates or non-UC affiliated institutions. And we don't always know if these requests are coming from students or faculty members on other campuses, but I do think it's great to know that the collection is well utilized by scholars outside of our local area. And of course, this type of remote request is becoming the norm now due to the realities and the restrictions of the pandemic. Though our reading room has been closed since March 2020, we are still providing reference services through email and Zoom. And we are also able to process these scan requests, which we call reproductions. Uh, next slide, please. I also want to talk about the primary uses of the Eaton Collection. So teaching is one of the main ways that we take advantage of having this amazing resource at UCR. We consistently teach several classes a quarter that rely on materials from the Eaton Collection. And these classes are not just limited to the speculative fictions and cultures of science program that Andrew mentioned earlier. Um, these classes can come from many diverse UCR departments. For instance, in the last year, we've done classes for psychology, history, comparative literature, media and cultural studies, as well as the English department. And we're especially excited when classes want to incorporate diversity within science fiction as one of their themes. For instance, with the history department, we've had the pleasure of highlighting Afrofuturism in Nigerian sci-fi, as well as Black representation and resistance in comic books. In addition to teaching, we have scholars who use the collection for their own research. And in fact, Andrew and I uh, recently used materials from the collection to co-publish an article advocating for more archives to collect and preserve fandom culture. Our article focused on our unique holdings of Star Trek slash fan fiction in Yaoi or boys love manga, which are examples of queer fandom culture from a primarily female gaze. And lastly, we use the collection extensively in our outreach efforts. And our outreach can take many forms, including exhibits, events, tours, and social media initiatives. So now let's take a closer look at some of the examples of our outreach. Next slide. One example of our outreach actually incorporates scholarly research and teaching, and that is our research guides. So we've developed several research guides to help scholars navigate this massive collection. Um, so these are some of the best ways to become acquainted with the Ian Collection, particularly if you have a theme or a topic that you want to explore and you just don't know where to start yet. So I'll share a quick summary for each of these guides, and I believe you will also be receiving direct links to them after today's presentation. The first one is called BIPOC, meaning Black, Indigenous, People of Color, and LGBTQ plus representation in UCR Special Collections. So this guide surveys many different types of materials in our collections, including books, ephemera like newspapers, manuscript or archival collections, etc. And this one isn't limited just to Eaton, but it does highlight several works within the Eaton collection. This guide focuses on materials made by people who identify as both BIPOC and LGBTQ+, but it also includes works by allies who don't necessarily identify with these communities, yet have written works that are recognized as significant and valuable to these identities. And one example of that would be Octavia Butler, um, who's very well known for participating in Afrofuturism and sci-fi. Secondly, we have the author's papers in the Eaton Collection Guide. And that gives you a brief overview of all the different author-related content that we have represented in the Eaton Collection. And so this is gonna highlight only manuscript or archival material. And it's great because there's also a sample image for each of these collections. And that can be really helpful in determining if this is the sort of material that you're looking for. Lastly, we have the fandom materials in the Eaton Collection Guide. And this is far more varied in scope and in format. This guide gives you an overview of all the different ways that fandom is represented in the Eaton, including things like fanzines, convention materials, collectibles and realia, anime and manga, et cetera. So like all of our public facing works, these are continuously evolving resources and we do welcome community input. 
So if you're a fan or a scholar of these fields and you have insight to share with us, please do reach out. And even if you have general feedback or questions, we would love to hear from you. Uh, next slide. I'd also like to touch on some of the significant early outreach that occurred before our time with the Eaton Collection. The first is the Eaton Conference, which ran for 25 years and served as a gathering space for scholars and fans of sci-fi to congregate and share their knowledge through presentations and dialogue. The conference was a significant factor in validating the study of sci-fi among academic circles. As Andrew mentioned earlier, at the time that the Eaton Collection was started, the study of sci-fi was not being taken seriously by many scholars, and its curator Slusser struggled to advocate for the field. But the Eaton Conference was one way that he was really successful in advocating for it. Secondly, we have the Eaton Journal of Archival Research and Science Fiction. This was a peer reviewed and open access online journal that was organized by doctoral students in that speculative fictions and cultures of science program. It ran from 2013 to 2018 and it served a unique purpose in that it provided a place to engage with the study of sci-fi through archival research. And it also served as an avenue for graduate students to be able to publish their own work. Next slide. So we have some exciting new directions that we are exploring in regards to current outreach for the Eaton Collection. Our goal is to develop an innovative, engaging and inclusive outreach that not only highlights our materials, but also creates a collaborative and community oriented space within our department of special collections and university archives. We are also eager to showcase and contribute to scholarship that elevates underrepresented voices and perspectives. So as the outreach librarian for special collections, my position is fairly new and I was only on campus for six months before the pandemic lockdowns occurred. And then we had to transition to remote work. Unfortunately, that means a lot of the original outreach plans that we had uh, you know, set up had to be canceled. But I would like to share some of those events with you to give you an idea of the different types of outreach that we had planned prior to the pandemic and that we hope to still do in the future. One of those events was called Crossing the Boundaries, a conversation on Chinese sci-fi. And this was planned to be a scholarly talk um, with an adjoining pop-up exhibit with a recognized uh, Chinese sci-fi author who was a visiting scholar at UCR. As Andrew mentioned, Chinese sci-fi is really seeing a resurgence in the US. And so this is a really important part of the field that we wanna engage with. Another event we had planned was reproductive injustice and speculative fiction. And this was planned to be a scholarly panel of faculty and doctoral students discussing feminism and bodily autonomy in speculative fiction. And our third event was Costo Cafe, Indigenous Comics, Manga and More. And this was planned to be a pop-up manga style event that highlighted our graphic novel collection and our comics alongside scholarly talks about diverse representation in popular media. Fortunately, once we got our footing, we were able to organize a few new events. And you can see some pictures from those here on the slide. So on the left, we see a banner for our event titled On Slash Fan Fiction and Yaoi Manga, which was a scholarly talk that was based on the article that Andrew and I co-wrote and that I mentioned earlier. And this is great because our audience was primarily undergraduate students. So there was a lot of interest and engagement from a population that doesn't always you know, come to special collections. And on the right, you can see a draft for a worksheet, which is from a collaboration that we are doing with the UCR Astronomy Club. So the Astronomy Club is hosting a series of virtual events geared towards teaching younger students, fourth graders specifically, about astronomy and science. And they've invited us to do a presentation about the connection between science fiction and actual real science. So we scanned some of our pulp magazines and we converted them into coloring sheets to be able to do some hands-on interactive activities with this younger audience. But through this presentation, we, we will be comparing examples of science fiction art from these pulp magazine covers to the actual science that uh, scientific knowledge that we had from the corresponding era. So if these events sound interesting to you and you want to know more about them, we encourage you to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook using our handle at UCR Library. That's where you can learn about any new upcoming events we have. And you can also visit our website to keep track of what we're gonna be doing in the future. Next slide. Okay, so now we'll transition to talking more about the future of the Eaton Collection. So I'll pass it back to Andrew. Oh, sorry, Andrew, you're still on mute. <laughs> I hope to unmute. Um, 
I mentioned earlier uh, George Slusser, and we talked about the Eaton Conference and and you know the the role that a curator has uh, in building a collection. And right now um, we are in the process of looking for. Um, a new curator for the Eaton Collection. So that is uh, one element that will be changing in the future that will help grow grow and build the collection. Um, and, and really the idea is that we want to build the collection uh, for the 21st century uh, and beyond. Uh, there's a lot of science fiction, there's a, there's a lot of history uh, within the field of science fiction. And it's really important to, to capture and, and um, document that, have it in the archives. Um, but we're also in a very exciting uh, moment within science fiction history, if you want to think of it that way. Um, science fiction and fantasy sort of go through boom and bust cycles in, in a sense, right? You have, um, right, I was mentioning different movements like the new wave or the golden age or the cyberpunk, right? You have, you have pieces um, emerge within science fiction, these new ideas um, new creative, new creativities uh, that emerge, and you have these moments of sort of innovation within science fiction, followed by um, periods with you know a little less um, excitement or change. And right now, we're in the middle of one of those. Um, uh, we've mentioned Afrofuturism, and the just the general push to bring new voices into the fields of science fiction and fantasy. And so, it's really important that. Um, you know, the Eaton Collection is present and captures that as, as it's happening around us and preserves that for um, future students and scholars who are interested in uh, the development of Afrofuturism and alternative futurisms, um, you know, during this time. So that is definitely one thing that we want to do uh, as we move forward, just to make sure that, that we're building the collection uh, for the future and, and make sure that we're, we're capturing these new ideas and new voices uh, that are changing science fiction and fantasy as so much as they are. Uh, and one interesting aspect of this is the uh, the real rise of uh, comics and graphic novels uh, within pop culture, and especially as a space for um, you know that's that's welcoming and uh, provides uh, room for people you know with new ideas or um, you know, diverse backgrounds to really add their voice and add their creativity to what's going on within uh, the field uh, at large. So uh, we've been making a pretty big push to incorporate um, uh, a lot more uh, graphic novel content from uh, a, a wide range of different communities and creators. So and I think Sandy will, will mention that a little bit uh, in just a moment. Yeah, and I think just to expand a little bit on this third bullet dot that we have here, um, I believe that expanding our outreach and our community engagement goes hand in hand with so many of these other goals in terms of the future of the Eaton Collection. Um, in order to be a, you know, a welcoming space for new voices, we really need to expand our reach and promote wider access to these important materials. So I'm excited to share a little bit more about that on the next slide. All right, so now we've given you a taste of the bigger scope and all these like large aspects of the Eaton Collection, but we also wanna narrow it down for you and share some of our own personal highlights from the collection. And it is really difficult to pick a favorite item or even just one or two favorite items. As you can tell on this slide, I have three already on here, um, but I thought these would be kind of fun to share with you today. So I chose these three items, which are a book, a comic, and a graphic novel slash manga to represent our Indigenous Futurisms Collecting Initiative. And Andrew did allude to this earlier, um, but when we want to expand Eaton, you know, we don't wanna include just the core and the traditional uh, Anglo-American um, uh, culturally significant works. We also wanna incorporate these alternative perspectives and realities and experiences. So these acquisitions are part of that journey to making our collecting practices more inclusive and contemporary. And these items fit our scope for many reasons, but I find them especially beautiful because they represent all of these fascinating intersections. For example, on the far right, you see this Haida manga, um, Haida being an indigenous culture from the Northwest region of the US, and it's called Red. And so this is a really beautiful intersection of indigenous culture with manga culture. And both of those are my, you know, part of my own personal research interests as well. And oftentimes when we work in libraries or special collections or archives, we tend to only see a one dimensional representation of indigenous cultures. And that representation is very likely a historical one. 
And of course, there's value to preserving, you know, historical evidence and materials like photographs when it's appropriate. Um, but if that's all we ever collect, then it's easy to forget that there are creative advances emerging from these cultures. And these types of materials can help show us those creative advances. And that's the beauty of working with the Eaton Collection, that it gives us this opportunity to preserve and document creative and speculative perspectives like indigenous futurisms. And then we can put these unique materials in conversation with some of those other historical important um, evidence. So that in combination with some equitable community engagement can give us a broader perspective on what indigenous culture might have looked like 100 years ago and what it might look like 100 years from now. Next slide. So as Sandy said, it's really hard to pick a thing to share because uh, there's there's just so much that's really cool in this collection. Um, I, we were talking beforehand uh, before this event started. Just right there's there's so much that even those of us who are working with it all the time, uh, we're still stumbling on things. We still find things hidden in corners, or you know, you just happen to open a box that has something that jumps out at you on any uh, you know a particularly given day. Um, and this is this is one of those uh, one of those things that kind of jumped out to me. Uh, so a couple yeah, a couple of years ago now. <laughs> um, Back in early 20, late 2018, early 2019, we had a new um, collection of authors' papers come in, the Pool and Karen Anderson papers. And in that collection, they they were really engaged uh, with uh, fandom culture as well as as the, the the professional scene. And they were involved with a lot of fanzines. Uh, and one of the fanzines that they helped uh, create was called Amra, which is uh, sort of this Conan the Barbarian fanzine that was aimed at this sort of sword and sorcery type uh, storytelling. But one thing that I found just thumbing through one one day while I was working on the collection was uh, this uh, talk given by Frank Herbert. Um, right, it, it sort of jumps out off the page at you, uh, the, the, the picture does. And uh, I really like Dune, it's one of my favorite novels. And so this just really caught my eye. And when I started to read it, I realized that this, so this was a talk that he gave in 1964 uh, at uh, Pacificon 2. So that was uh, one of the big regional uh, science fiction conventions on the West Coast. And uh, in this talk, this is a transcript of the talk that he gave to an audience you know, at the convention. And it's just him sort of riffing and talking about uh, his world building process for creating uh, Arrakis uh, and the, the world of Dune. Um, and it, you know, for anybody who doesn't know that story, he was working as a journalist, I believe, and he came to the West Coast uh, for a project and uh, they were in Southern Oregon um, where there are sand dunes. And so he was doing this journalistic project talking about the work, the scientific work that people were doing on the sand dunes and it had left such a big impact on him that it led to the creation of this whole new science fiction setting and it ended up turning into a book. Uh, and so I think it's just this really amazing example of how, right, when you have something like an author's papers or you have some of these historical documents where you get that, you can see the nugget, the, the, the one little thing that catches somebody's imagination and then can turn into you know, one of the, uh, the most well-known books within the history of the genre, right? And you can sort of put that story together uh, through looking at the historical documents. Is that's, That just, to me, is, is really what archives are great at doing. And that's why it's so much fun to work in an archive. So I just thought that would be a fun one to, to pull out for you all to see. And I think that's it for us. Yeah, so that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you all for your time and your attention. Um, we hope this information was helpful for you and that it you know, piqued your interest in maybe exploring this collection yourself someday. So we would like to start our Q&A portion of today's event. And if anyone has any questions to ask, we would love to hear them. Well, we actually do have a couple of questions. The first one is, can UCR International Scholars um, have use of this collection? Can they access the collection? 
Sandy, do you want yeah. to? Sure. Yeah, that, that's actually a really amazing thing about the Eaton Collection is that it's open to anyone. The general public is also welcome to come and utilize it. So during normal, um, you know, pre-pandemic times, um, anyone would be able to come into the fourth floor of the Rivera Library. And then you um, will have someone at the front desk that would show you all of the different policies that we have. And then they'll um, set you up with a free account on our system. And that's what you can use to request any items from all of our collections. They do need to be used in our reading room. And that's just to maintain the security of the items and be able to preserve them to the best of our abilities. But you can also request scans of certain items. And so you just go to our website online and we have a whole a tutorial on there on how to do that or email one of us and we'd be happy to walk you through it through email or through a Zoom appointment. Uh, Meli, can I continue my question? Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Lots of things I learned about it. I'm so glad I joined this webinar. Thank you so much in inviting me and including me. And my yeah, I want to uh, continue to my question. So any scholars, who's the international scholars coming to do research, because some of the scholars just coming to UCR because of the collections, because of the uh, Riviera Library, they are saying that our library is there unique and then uh, in the world, uh, only the UCR has uh, this collection, is not the other uh, institutions. I heard that it's very famous that our library and then uh, these collections, and then do, do they need to just have the UCR ID and uh, just uh, request to uh, use the collections or do, do they need to use UCR email address or what is the requirement for this, our scholars? Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so no, you don't need a UCR ID or a UCR email. Um, anyone, in, anyone in the general public is welcome to, um, to see the collection. They will ask you for a some some type of ID, and that's just to verify, um, you know, your name and making sure that we don't confuse accounts in any way. But they don't take a copy of any IDs, and it doesn't have to be a UCR specific ID. So it could be like a driver's license, a passport, any other kind, just to verify your name. Uh, sorry, last questions. Are they get any books, any materials to out of the library, or they have to work in the library? or they scan the documents or just in the library, right? Yes, that's correct. That's what um, differentiates special collections materials from the general collections of the library is our materials have to be used in our space, in our reading room, but we can scan materials. Right now we're actually offering up to 200 pages a month for free scanning for any UC affiliate. And you can actually get more than 200 pages. We just ask that you meet with one of our archivists or librarians just to make sure that you're finding all the resources that you need. Oh, sounds great. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to learn about this information so I can ask the scholars. Thank you so much for asking questions. Thank you so much. And I just want to share with those of you who are joining us that um, we, some of us, have behind us an image of our campus. Uh, all of us mostly do, um, except Magbule, who has a beautiful picture of Turkey with her, with the nice uh, balloons behind her. Um, but I wanted to share that um, Andrew, uh, Michael, and I have the Rivera Library as our backdrop. So those are our famous arches at UC Riverside that also are the facade of the library that we're talking about. Um, so I'd like to invite Lita, I believe her name is Lita, to please ask her questions. She raised her hand earlier in the presentation and I invited her to please ask a question through the Q&A, but I don't see a question from her. So Lita, if you're still with us, please ask your question. Um, someone else has asked if you might be able to make the PowerPoint presentation available to be emailed as well. And if yeah, so, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can, uh, I think we just need to uh, send you a link and you can include that in the, in the email you sent out. That's perfect, yes. Um, so I like to do, I like to follow up uh, quickly maybe tomorrow at some point. Uh, Glenn Sturgeon has raised his hand. 
Um, Michael, are you able to help me with this? Oh, we have two participants who have raised their hands, so nobody's going to the Q and A. We can we can unmute him if he wants to have him talk. Oh, he's been unmuted. Okay. Oh, okay. yes, I've been unmuted. Yes. Hi. Um, one of my favorite things about the Eaton Library is um, just the scope of its collection and all the cool things you can find in there. But a lot of students would ask me how they exactly can access or know where to start looking to really explore the Eaton. Yeah. Uh, hi, Glenn. <laughs> Glad hi. you could make it. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, Glenn worked with us uh, for a while. Uh, so it's great to hear from you, Glenn. Um, and that's a really great question. Uh, and it's, it is quite daunting, right? And that's, that's one of the things that makes archives and special collections as a whole just seem sort of uh, opaque, right? You, do, you don't even know where to start necessarily, uh, which is first off, that's what we're for, right? Um, so uh, Sandy and I are more than happy, you know, if you ever have any questions, um, you know, our email's on the screen, you're welcome to reach out to us. Uh, and we can help try to, you know, to narrow that stuff down um, to help figure out points of access and, and figure out what you want. Um, and that's also, um, right, we, we've started to work on things like the LibGuides, um, which help. Uh, they can, you know, provide another point of access. Um, I don't think we mentioned, so for all of the archival collections, so the manuscript materials like the author's papers or some of the fandom collections, uh, a lot of them have what are called finding aids, uh, which are, you can think of it like a table of contents uh, for a book in a way. Uh, those all exist on what's called the Online Archive of California. And if you just Google that, um, it'll be the first thing that shows up. And then you can, you can find uh, UCR in there. You have to navigate through it a little bit. Um, but that's also a great tool too, in general, just because it connects um, all of the archival institutions or most of the archival institutions in the state of California. So you can, you know, you can search for something and, and find results at UCLA or Davis or some of the historical societies. Um, so that's a really good um, way to try and find the things you're looking for. Uh, some of our materials are also in the library catalog. So you can um, write if you wanted to, to find a copy of Dune, you could go to the library catalog and search for Frank Herbert and see all of the, the materials by him that are in there or specific titles. Um, it, it can get a little overwhelming again, right? I mentioned there's, there's over 200,000 catalog items in the Eaton collection at this point and the general library collections are even larger. So sometimes it can feel like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but again, that's why, uh, you know, Sandy and I are here. Uh, we're happy to, to help navigate uh, those systems. And I'd also, oh, right, and hi, Glenn, thanks for your question. Um, I just wanted to tag on to Andrew's answer and say, um, if you are just kind of curious to get a taste for it, I would suggest looking up our social media, particularly our Instagram. Um, I know that they like to highlight different items from special collections there. And so sometimes you can get like little sneak peeks of collections, like scans of a few photographs or just a few papers. So it's kind of nice if you're just trying to browse and see what's there. And then also just attending our events. Um, we do try to highlight materials from our own collections, you know, and, and showcase them in these events or sometimes showcase them in conversation with materials from other collections and other institutions. But those are some other ways you can learn more. Thank you. We do have a question. Um, will there be more diversity programming with speakers around indigenous futurism? Yes, most definitely there will be. <laughs> um, I think that that's something that's a really big focus for us in the future. And we really, we do try when we do our outreach to be as collaborative as possible. So in the other events um, that I've listed, we've collaborated with folks like the Native American Student Programs, um, Pacific Asian Student Programs, the LGBT Center at UCR. So we're always looking for ways that we can you know, elevate these underrepresented voices and be able to collaborate with our colleagues in other areas outside of the library. So yeah, definitely stay tuned to our social media to see. Um, I can give you a sneak peek of our next event. While not Indigenous Futurisms, it's actually going to be on comics in COVID-19. And so looking at how comics have kind of helped some people process the trauma of the pandemic and also served as public health 
information tools during this pandemic. So that's going to be a presentation and also a hands-on workshop through Zoom on comic making with one of our adjunct faculty at UCR. And so both speakers um, are women of color. And so um, that's gonna be another really interesting multicultural event. And we highly recommend that you follow us on social media to learn when that is in May, 2021. That's excellent. I have a question. So it piqued my interest to hear that some of the um, pulp magazines uh, reflect, um, what did you say, social and cultural critique um, of the time. So is that also true of what you were, what we can find in this collection from international sources? That's a good question. Um, so it, it wasn't so much the the pulps, although you, you'll find it in the visual representation to like mm -hmm. book covers, pulp covers. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the, the genre as a whole is it, it, that's a real strength of science fiction, just that social and cultural critique aspect. Um, internationally, so right, Sandy mentioned right, we have science fiction historically is a very Anglo-American, you know, Northern, Western, white product. Um, and a lot of what you found elsewhere was translations. So you would go, you know, to pick a country and you'd find Asimov translated into the local language or, you know, uh, Ray Bradbury translated. So that was a lot of what was happening. There are some uh original works in other languages in the Eaton collection um mm -hmm. particularly from like france um and there's a couple other regions we have a pretty sizable uh chinese section um, and manga section in japanese um but uh i am i am not a, enough of a polyglot to be able to to speak to the you know how much there was going on in a lot of those other countries um in some of the places like in, in russia during you know the height of the cold war there was a lot of censorship um so science fiction in in some ways provides a tool for people to use to critique because it might slip past the censors because the censors don't actually right. know what's be right um but at the same time it's just harder to get things out right um mm. So yeah, that's, it's definitely, um, I would say probably, uh, and I have always wanted to, to do a project that looks at some of that, like looking, looking in South America, looking in Eastern Germany, looking at other Eastern European countries and comparing, right, what was going on within the science fiction, yeah. you know, communities there compared to what was going on in, in the United States and say, you know, 19, the late 1950s, um, mm -hmm. right when you're sort of at that peak um, peak moment of the early Cold War. But yeah, it's it's that's a, a really broad question for sure. Uh, but I would be I'd be shocked. I I, I like I said I want to do a project, and I would be shocked if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't out there, and if science fiction uh, wasn't ser you know serving that same purpose in other countries. Very good. Thank you. Well. Um... I don't see any more questions. Do any of the panelists have any questions for our presenters? It looks like we're done. Thank you all so much. Again, fascinating. So much to think about and, and discover in, those, in the collection. And um, please, um, if there's any time that we can promote another event, uh, for you through the APRU Virtual Student Exchange uh, Partnerships. We're happy to do it. So thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.